Good morning, and welcome to Snow Hill's Sunday online Bible study. Uh, different background. There's no tree in the background. In fact, you guessed it. Yes, I'm in my office. Uh, Paul's over there in his. You think he's got a clock or an instrument on the wall. We should probably make him play it. What is that, Paul? That is a dulcimer that I, I built. Ah, you all didn't know how talented that Littleton was. He's got me for sure. Well, listen, we're glad to be together this morning, and um, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction. So, um, you know, we spent quite a few weeks uh, looking at the Nicene Creed and um, uh, as a way to kind of connect us with what has the church believed. And um, we're probably going to reference this a few times this morning, but um, Paul made a good point as we were walking through that, and that was that creeds and confessions that developed over the history of, uh, well, the 2,000-year history of the church did so as a result of either, one, external questions or internal questions. That is, they themselves needed to determine what does this new revelation of God and Jesus Christ mean to us in our living, and two, as people were observing this new developing uh, religion, if you will, uh, they wanted to know, well, so what does all this mean? And how, how uh, do we respond uh, to those questions from critics or inquisitors? And uh, so that's where we are. So we've got a place, we got a way to go, and we'll get to there in just a minute. But I wanted to tie us in. And before we go anywhere, let's make sure you have your Bible, a cup of coffee, a glass of orange juice. You are ready this morning. And we're going to have Paul lead us in prayer as we get started. All right. Well, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to gather as your people, even uh, virtually, and we're thankful that you're still speaking to us, you're still present with us, and so as we consider your word, as we consider uh, your calling on our lives, who you are and what that means for us and our lives in this world, uh, we just pray once again that you will guide our discussion and our thoughts that they might be directed toward you uh, and our own faithfulness uh, in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 28. Here's what we're going to do. So now that we have spent some time uh, connecting uh, with what the church has always believed and how that's developed over time, and just so that we know that what we believe today didn't, it, it just didn't kind of drop out in 2020 or uh, 1950 or 1850 for that matter. But what the church has believed has, has, has had this core at, at, as it has moved through history. What we want to do is we want to turn our attention to talking about, so what now? And, and again, you'll remember, Paul is really good at trying to nail us on the practical side by saying, so what does it mean? And that kind of is a segment we try to hit one way or another is just to say, okay, so what is all this? We're not looking to fill our heads with information. What we are looking for is to be apprehended and apprehend. And let me explain that real quick. We know that God speaks to us in the scriptures by his spirit. And so God's not really interested in us becoming encyclopedic, that is, knowing everything that's possible to know. What he wants us to know is about himself. And so the word apprehend means I'm trying to understand. I want to understand what is God up to, what is God like, and what does that, that mean? So we want to apprehend God, but also we need to know that the very fact that God reveals himself to us in Jesus by his Spirit through the Scriptures— is that God is apprehending us. Now, it's not that God uh, has something he doesn't know about us, but he's looking to apprehend a relationship with us. And that's what we like to talk about. One of our emphases, you know, God's not less than personal, and he has a personal relationship with his creation, including we human beings. And so as such, what does what the church has always believed mean for uh, our living? What shape should uh, our lives in relationship to God through the church look like. And so I wanted to look at a familiar verse to many. It's, it's uh, in, Roman, in Romans. Huh. It's in Matthew 28, 
And we, some of us remember it as the Great Commission. And so Jesus is speaking to the disciples, go, ther go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, now, now Paul, we, uh, we grew up and often the Great Commission was used as a motivator. It was to say, now that you know Jesus, you do this. And, and, and yet there is a way to translate the opening lines. Instead of go, it's as you're going. So what do you think that particular translation is aiming for when it rightly interprets the verbal form there as you are going? What Help us kind of think through what that means, what, what that matters for our understanding of this instruction that Jesus gives. Yeah, I, well, I think one of the primary things that comes to my mind is that it, it means that uh, the Great Commission is not just an activity that we go and and do um i mean and, and southern baptist churches i don't know outside of southern baptist churches there there may be other denominations that have uh been real prominent with some of these sort of things but uh we've had a tendency to view specific targeted activities as being what what we're doing in obedience to that so uh, it used to be that churches had weekly visitation, and you'd get together uh, up at the church, and you'd get names of people who visited, or maybe they hadn't been there in a while, and you're going to go out, and you're going to visit them, or uh, you're going to go door-to-door -door, uh, soul winning, uh, things, th things of that nature, and it got kind of boiled down to specific activities that we would do, but if we read that as, as you are going, then it becomes more about as I'm living my life, what are the kind of things that I'm doing as a part of that life? And one of the things that I mentioned the last time I preached uh, there at Snow Hill was uh, I, I referenced something that Dallas Willard has, has said, uh, that uh, human beings across cultures and across time tend to ask some of the same fundamental questions. And a couple of those questions are, what's a good life and how do I have it? So when we think about theology, and, and you know, I, I can see, you know, um, or imagine some folks, you know, their eyes kind of glazing over a little bit or rolling back or thinking that, you know, hey, this is going to be a good nap time or something of that nature. It, it's, as you said, it's not just about filling our heads with knowledge, but it's about answering those questions. I mean, I, I really think that everyone is invested in the answers to those questions. What's a good life? How do I get it? The gospel is the answer to that question. Uh, but it's more than just about going to heaven when you die. It's about uh, a, a life that is available now. Um, Jesus doesn't say that if you believe uh, that that eternal life is is just something in the future, but eternal life is something that you have now, that we can uh, attain here now in this life as we live it. And of course, I, again, I, I think everybody would want to know the answer to the question, how do I have, what is a good life? How, how would you define it? Uh, because it's being defined all around us, just turn your TV on and and skip through the show to the advertisements. <laughs> and the advertisements are trying to tell you this is what's going to give you a good life. It's the new car, it's uh, the the refinance mortgage, it's the 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 trinket or or whatever. These are things that are going to make your life fulfilling. And our our culture, particularly in America, is is built around kind of that consumer mindset that things can bring pleasure to life. And, and it's not that things are worthless uh, and, and we don't, uh, it, it's not that the Bible's answer is for us to all become ascetics and live in caves somewhere with just the bare necessities. Um, God made these things and made them good. It's a matter of keeping them in priority. But then once we have that life, 
Uh, and, and those of us who have trusted Jesus and who believe the gospel and believe that it is the answer to life, well, we still live life in this world. And now a part of that is showing other people how they can have that same kind of uh, fulfilling life. What, what makes life meaningful and how do I have it? So it's going to our friends and our our family members and our acquaintances and our coworkers and saying, hey, you're searching for the same things that I am as you go about life. And uh, so, you know, here's some things that I have found. It makes um, the Great Commission less confrontational and more relational. Um, it, it, one of the things that's been interesting since, uh, you know, I, I I'm not pastoring a church now, but I'm working out for a, a large corporation. The guy that sat next to me in the office is a Muslim. Uh, he is from Iraq, he, he and his family. Uh, they came over here for his mom to go to school uh, at OSU. She got a PhD at OSU. He uh, spent really most of his growing up years in Stillwater, and then they moved here. And, uh, but he, he's a Muslim from Iraq, and we, we have had numerous conversations about those questions. What's a good life? How do I have it? And how, how, how in his view, Islam answers that question, and how in my view, Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection answers that question. And so I haven't beaten him over the head with my Bible. Um, I, I haven't gotten confrontational with him about any of that. It's just been very conversational about, hey, here we are doing life. We're at work. We're um, doing the same kind of thing. But as you go, I'm trying to share with you my concept of what I've found in my own life to be what a good life is and how you have it. And that it's the answer is the gospel. The answer is Jesus. Um, so I, I think that's one of the ways that if we if we look at it not just as the command to go, but as you're going, as you're going about life, as you're mowing the lawn or whatever, and you your neighbor comes out and you start chit chatting or whatever, as the conversation arises, that you're taking the gospel with you. Yeah, and I think one of the things that that uh, that points to is is that uh, we that is all disciples to Jesus or Willard's word apprentices to Jesus, all Jesus people, Christians actually are caught up in the mission of God. And so when we really read these words that Jesus is, as you're going, he's actually telling the disciples you've, you've seen how this works. So each of the gospels record Jesus's travels and as he's traveling, he's confronted by people who's uh, looking for the answers to the very question Paul was describing. And they've been hindered or hampered by something. So they've, they've got hope that something will come, but they've, they've endured some sort of hardship, some sort of circumstance that has left them bewildered about it. And Jesus doesn't say, well, when you get the feeling better, come talk to me. At a more convenient time, why don't you make an appointment? As he's going, we witness Jesus on mission. So Jesus is actually on his own mission, and it takes in everyone he comes in contact with. So when we start talking about here's what the church has believed about Jesus, and we explore his life, one of the most notable things is Jesus is always going somewhere. And when Jesus is always going somewhere, he's always encountering someone. And when he does, he's helping to present answers to their questions, whether they are, whether their questions are the right ones or not. He always directs them to the real heart of the matter, even when he poses a different question to them. And so one of the things that I thought was a, a, might be a good, a good thing for us to do is, is to talk about how we view mission. Now, we are just finishing up. Our emphasis on uh, Lottie Moon's uh, Christmas offering for international missions. And we tend to think about missions and missionaries as activities, as Paul described it. So a missionary does some activities so that qualifies them to be missionaries 
And that's somehow distinct from what you and I are doing. But what we find here in Matthew 28, in the words of Jesus, is actually, that's not true. Actually, all of us are, on, are, are swept up in God's mission. It's just where we do our going that makes the difference. And so someone who is a, a missionary to somewhere is really a Western idea. And what the dangers of it is, is to say that, well, because we have a class of people who specialize in that, it gets me off the hook so long as I give some money to make sure they're doing what, what, I, what I need them to do for me. And, and that really is to misconstrue something about God, because that's not what we see in Jesus. And this is the sort of thing that we want to come back to. When we start wondering, what is God up to? We want to look at Jesus. What is God doing? And so um, uh, Christopher uh, Wright wrote this large doorstop size volume on the mission of God. And I, I have not read the whole thing. When I say doorstop, folks, I mean doorstop, like steel doorstop. It's huge. But but what he's trying to capture is the thread throughout the scriptures that, that God actually is involved in his own mission. And, and in order for us to kind of cipher or discern what that looks like to make sense of it is to look at Jesus's life. And when we see that Jesus was on mission himself, then when he's now standing with his disciples, what we know is going to happen next is he's going to be ascended, taken up into heaven, the disciples are going to be left, and he's like, okay, now it's time for your travels. Wherever your feet take you, this is kind of the, what you do. Do what I did. And, and so we have constructed a form of life and a form of church where we can literally, uh, we, we've literally trained people to think, sometimes me and you us to think that these particular activities we can pay someone to do for us. And, and so I don't, I don't mean to step on any toes here, but, but listen, um, I, I have no trouble except the pandemic has curtailed this, but I, I learned, I learned that it's very important to visit people in the places where they're hurting. So going to the hospital is, is not a problem. Going to pray with folks at a hospital is not a problem. But I will tell you that I can show up at a meeting where someone needs a prayer, and I become the professional prayer. It's as if no one else in the room is qualified to pray if I'm present. Well, that's what I mean by some an activity that we have someone else who can do for us. And this is kind of, uh, unfortunately, this is, as Paul pointed out, part of what has happened when the culture has influenced us to be consumers. And before we became uh, consumers, consumptive sorts of people, we were producers. And, and that, you can go back and look at the sociological history, economic history of our country, and this is the shift. And it's not that our production is something that advantages us to God. It's that God produces a work in us. That's what Paul says, uh, that God is, um, he's confident God's going to finish the work he started in you and in me. So God is producing something. So we're swept up in God's mission, and, and through us, we're participating in God's mission as he produces in us uh, opportunities as we travel to take the good news, doing what Jesus did. So all of that uh, as, as kind of introductory and backdrop to say, how does this connect or tie with a Nicene Creed? Well, one of the first ways that it does, and we'll, we'll take a broad brush here, is that when if you remember looking at the Creed, there were articles about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so we talked at the end about the Trinity, the Trinitarian nature of God. And we tried to put that, you know, it's heady, it's, it's, and, and I think Paul's best line, what was that, what was that line from uh, N.T. Wright, if, if, um, uh, it, it, where he said, if, um, if the New Testament hadn't uh, given us the 
doctrine of the Trinity, Paul would have had to, have, it felt like he would have had to have invented it. Yeah, to make sense of the relational side of what we see revealed in the Scriptures, Father, Son, and Spirit, would have required Paul to come up with something that expressed that, so that we have Father, Son, and Spirit emphasizing <clears throat> the relationality in God. Weird maybe for you to hear that way, but the relationality in God. Um, now we talk about, ah, let's talk about something about the nature of God. And, and so, Paul, um, we didn't talk about this, but I think we can probably pull this off. Um, there is a difference when, um, when I talk about um, the nature of God and the attributes of God. So um, how can you help? You're, you're the good kind of, okay, let's see if we can, let, let, let's see what does this matter and what does it mean. But, the, but how would you help us uh, kind of line out the difference? If we're going to say God's essential nature, for instance, is love, how's that, how do we understand it in relationship to when we talk about God's attributes of goodness and mercy and grace and justice? And uh, so how... You, do you have, did I put you on the spot? Well, I mean, I've, I've thought about that. Um, Todd did send me an email earlier and said, hey, this is kind of the direction that um, I'm thinking about us going. So I've had some, some opportunity to think that through a little bit. And in, in my mind, when I think of an attribute, I think of something that's descriptive. It's trying to describe something. Um, you and I have attributes. Mm -hmm. um, some of our attributes are, uh, going to be different. Um, some of the attributes that people may use to describe me, uh, not all of them might be flattering. Um, and they might be things that when I think about my own attributes, I would think, man, um, that needs some work and it needs some change. Now, I understand God's attributes are unchanging and so forth, but uh, from that standpoint, when I think of an attribute, I think of a descriptive characteristic that I can change. Uh, there are parts of my nature that, I mean, there, there's just, there's no amount of work or activity or, or anything that I could change about that. My fundamental nature is the nature of a human being. It's not the nature of a duck. And because of that, I don't quack and I don't eat grubs out of the yard and I don't fly. And I never will do those things. Well, God willing, I'll never eat grubs out of the yard. But <laughs> but it's it's not, if I do though, it won't be because that's in my nature to do it. <laughs> Coercion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe I've gone crazy like Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, <laughs> you know, when he howled at the moon. Yes. But it's, that's not in my nature. And the things that are a part of my nature are things that don't you don't even consider changing. And so when I think about the nature of God, I'm not just thinking about things that describe him, but I'm thinking about fundamentally, who is he? Mm -hmm. So I think of a passage like when John says um, that God is love. He's, he's not simply talking about an attribute of God or, or a way to describe God, but he's saying fundamentally who God is is one who expresses love toward others. And I mean, we've just talk, gone through the Nicene Creed. Uh, at its root, it's the love shared between Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm -hmm. But then it's also the love that is poured out on us. And so uh, when I think of God's nature, I think that part of his nature is to give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He loved the world. He gave. It, it, it was. It's just a part of his nature to be giving. Um, I've even used that uh, as, you know, if we're as we're becoming like God, then it ought to be our nature to give as well. 
um, mm -hmm. to open up the fist and and to mm -hmm. to give. So when I think of the nature of something, I'm I'm thinking of what makes it what it is, or or what makes them who they are, what makes him who he is, or her who she is. Um, when I think of an attribute, I, I just think of descriptive. Well, you know, he's he's balding. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. it, uh, that's an attribute of mine. <laughs> I don't think Rogaine's going to change that. So um, that. I guess is kind of how I think about the differences between what would be an attribute of God and what would be fundamental to his nature. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think it's incredibly helpful to think about something that describes to something that is. So for instance, there's a new little book that's been considered um, a rival to CS Lewis's mere Christianity. And uh, I, I've got it in, in the other other office. So you'll just have to trust me that there is such a book. Uh, but it is the, in the title, it is um, the God who is love. And, and what the writer's talking about is, is as Paul said, the fundamental character, the fundamental nature, who God is. And here's, here's kind of something that may help if I can. When we were talking about the Nicene Creed and what we believe, we, we got to the place where we were describing the fact that one of the great questions that was being asked is what's the relationship between the father and the son? And so the big question was, was one of what, what was called substance. And, 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 and you talk about glazed eyes, Paul, that probably will, will trigger it right there. But, but honestly, that, that was the, the central question was how does a father and son relate and so the question for them, because of the way their way of looking at the world was, was, is the son of the same substance as the father? And if you recall what we were, what they were framing it as is they understood the world was made up of certain substances. And, and a long, long ago, there were four primary substances. And then with the advent of the scientific revolution and and um, some discoveries, now all of a sudden we're asking, well, what, what's deeper than dirt? What's, wh what, what makes up air? What makes up uh, fire? And, and so these things that were once the central substances of all that is, we started looking and then we discovered atoms. And then after that, quarks and strings, we're looking for the substance. Well, that was the central question. What is, is the son the same substance of the father? And they ask the same thing about the spirit. Well, the, the thing about love, love isn't a substance. Love is an action. Love is an event. And so when we start talking about what is God's nature, we have to make sure we're not confused by thinking, well, what's God's substance? Like, does he just look like um, a, a wise old Gandalf? Is that, is that who God is? Uh, no, what, what folks are trying to apprehend or grasp that, they, uh, that has been revealed in Jesus is, is God's nature is love. So John can say God is love. He's not saying that God, God likes to love, although he does. He's not saying that God is loving, which is a description, which he is. But he's saying God is at his nature, at the core, is love. I like what one of my friends describes as, uh, uh, that love as God's um, uh, self-giving, other-directed love. And the reason I like that definition is because it fits God whose nature of love is always on mission. That is, when Paul said a while ago, which I thought was, was a great way to put it, what we are witnessing when we're witnessing a God who is love is a God who in himself has the capacity to express and receive and give love in God's self, Father, Son, and Spirit. It's the language of John's gospel. It's the language of Jesus when he's talking about his own ministry of, I only do what I see the Father doing, and I only say what I hear the Father saying. The, the mutuality, this, the giving and receiving of the sort of love that exists within God, God is determined he wants to incorporate all that he has made including we human beings. 
And so when we say God is love, it's not that God all of a sudden discovered a love um, nerve. It's that that is the, that is, that is who God is at his core is love. And the way we encounter that love is God's nature. Paul used the word giving. I, 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 that's, I'm, I'm totally happy with that, but giving is mission. God, God gave his son is the way we talk about God's mission to the world. God's mission is to say, listen, this love that we share is so big and so expansive. We're going to share it with everything that we have made and everyone that we have made. So that means God's nature includes this mission that Jesus describes right here in Matthew uh, 28, uh, verse number 19. That's an outgrowth of who God is, which then means, Paul, doesn't it doesn't then kind of you're the better logician between us, the better logic dude. But then it, it kind of follows then that, that if we've experienced the gift, then then now we're we're now kind of it's not now we have an activity to do. We actually just continue to live into what that mission looks like. So help us think through how that works, because sometimes we forget that that. Some of these things w- w- that when we talk about what we believe, they provoke and evoke. They're not optional. Yeah. So, I mean, let's go back to uh, the the discussion about the nature of things. Um, we come into this world with human nature that's fallen, but then we're redeemed and we're given a new nature. Now, we know that in this life that those two are still in some measure of conflict with each other, but one of the goals of the Christian life is that the redeemed nature that we received uh, from Christ when we trusted him is progressively throughout our lives taking over. Now, it's not just that our, our behavior is changing. It's that our nature is changing. And so going back to uh, the old standard, Dallas Willard, um, he, he mentions in, I, I think it's his uh, book, Divine Conspiracy, but he, he, uh, I, I know he mentions it in a number of occasions because it was, uh, I think, fairly prominent for him when he talks about where Jesus said, uh, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, that ultimately, the kind of life that God calls us to is not meant to be difficult. It's meant to be easy. It's not a it, it's not a a burden that we're li- that we are meant to go. Oh, I just I, I'm never going to make it. But and and yes, there are times when we have difficulty getting there. But the goal, the end goal, is that it becomes a a, a new nature for us, a second nature, so that. Our living out the kind of life that uh, we inherited in Christ is something that becomes a part of our nature. So it, it's not that I have activities that I need to check off of the list. It's just what I do because that's who I am now. I've become someone different. I'm not that old man that I used to be. Uh, Paul says that we are a new creation. Old things pass away all things have become new. So as that newness and the new nature begins to take over, then the things uh, like we see in the fruit of the spirit in Galatians, those things, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, uh, gentleness, self-control, all of those things begin to become a new natural for us. Uh, Yes, while, you know, initially we're, we're learning this as disciples as apprentices. And uh, so there may be challenges that we face in getting there, but the goal over time is that those become easier and easier for us because they have become more natural. Mm. And, and so it's, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, play, playing a sport, maybe um, you get out there and you're going to go golf for the first time. And, you know, they'll tell you that the golf swing from uh, the standpoint of physics is not real complicated. 
but you get out there on the golf course and <laughs> it feels really complicated. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I first started playing and man, you just hit the club head into the ground. You didn't even strike the ball or you swing over the top of it uh, or, or it goes somewhere wild uh, because, because my mechanics are not good. Um, and you and I remember when we first started out, we were teenagers and we would go golf with a guy that worked at the pro shop out at Lincoln Golf Course. And he got to a point, he was considerably, considerably better than we were. And he got to a point where he said, guys, I'm sorry, I just can't play with you anymore. That's right. <laughs> we were that bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think his exact line was, you know, it's really hard to play golf with you all. <laughs> <laughs> But you keep at it, and you might read articles from a golf magazine, or you, you know, in this day and age, you're going to go to YouTube and you're going to watch videos. You might go down to the pro shop and you might pay a guy for lessons, and they help you correct that swing and they start to show you what the motion looks like, and you just practice it over and over again. And eventually, even if it's not perfect from the standpoint of physics. I mean, they talk about how Lee Trevino, who was one of the great golfers of, of all time, but his swing was so awkward. When you watched his swing, it didn't look like it was the perfection of physics. <laughs> yeah. He had a kind of a reach out and he looped in and he swung and hit it, but somehow he, he, he practiced that over and over and over again to the point that he became so proficient that he could earn a living doing it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what the Christian life is, is sort of like, is you're practicing doing it over and over again. And at first, you're not very good at it. You know, you're supposed to bless those who curse you. And the first time someone curses me, I just curse them back. And man, I, so I swung over the top or I hit into the ground or whatever. And, the, you know, the next time I, I, I bless them, but I bless them through what Dallas Willard calls through gritted teeth. It's like, instead of genuinely blessing them, it's like, well, bless you too, brother, <laughs> you know, through, through gritted teeth. Well, I still didn't do it very well, but it was better than what I did the last time when I cursed them. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it becomes more natural that, you know what, I've gotten to a place to where I can look at that other person and see them in a way that God sees them. And I understand that that anger and that curse and, and whatever's coming out of them it is because of something that maybe they're struggling with that I'm not aware of. And instead of now looking at them with anger and just reacting because of the words that came out of their mouth, now I am able to look at them with compassion because what I don't realize is that he just lost his mother mm. Mm. or he just lost his job or something. And I was just the nearest target and I could have cursed him back, but instead I found a way to genuinely feel compassion for him, and I blessed him. And I mean, I, I genuinely said something that was kind and generous and forgiving and all of that. And, and you know how that turned out? Then he went, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I, I, I really didn't mean that, but this has been going on in my life, and it's, it, it's just been a real struggle, and you were just the nearest target for that. Mm -hmm. It, it changes the whole dynamic of our relationships. But that's something that you just learn to do and get more proficient at over time. And so it takes practice. And one of the things that Dallas Willard actually advocated for was that our churches become places of, the, uh, of not just theoretically talking about discipleship, but they become places of practice. And we all know that there are times in, in every church, in, in the life of the church, that You've got people that disagree with each other, or there's something that happens that somebody gets offended or hurt or, or whatever. Those are our practice moments, mm -hmm. and we may not do it well sometimes, but what the goal is that, okay, we didn't do it that well last time. What do we learn from that? Now, how do we, how do we get to the point now? that we begin to see each other with those eyes of maturity and, and the nature of love because who we are the nature of who we are is changing. So to me, it helps it to go back. When, when we think about 
the practical ways that this hits us, it's the same thing. It's, it's being changed in our own nature. We're talk, we talk about the nature of God. Well, what's our nature? And, and the difference is God's nature doesn't change, but ours is in the process of changing. Yeah, and what we and, and to tie that to the the nature of God is his love is expressed in such a way that it is going to sweep us up into it to produce that change. We would not know the distinctiveness of our nature and our lack had we not learned what love looked like. So had God not revealed himself in such a way that he could be described as God is love. We would just gone on assuming that the things that we do that we call love are in fact love when what we really find out when we consider God's love for us and Jesus is, well, it's, it's, it's not really even good saccharine. It's, it's not a good substitute for that. And that once we come face to face with love revealed in Jesus, then we then have to come to terms with, well, maybe what we're talking about is different than that. And we need and long for God to sweep us up and to affect that sort of change in our own nature. And so really the, the introductory bit here is, is to say that when a church or a group, a denomination get together to answer the question, God is, and fill in the blank, we are wanting to look at what does that, one, how has God revealed what that looks like, and then what's our response to that? And, and so we don't want to create for anyone in this next series of, of weeks um, the sense that we are setting up uh, certain conditions or certain activities that you and I must achieve in order to be, we are, we are really wanting to describe the fact that God's mission is ongoing, ongoing toward others, which always still includes us because we're still in the process of becoming. And so God's mission isn't done. It's never done. So when we look at the Great Commission as an activity, we think done is when someone confesses Jesus is Lord. And what we're saying is, is that, that that's part of the mission, but that the mission of God is much broader than just making sure that someone has confessed their sin and trusted in Jesus. Because that's to say that God's mission is only about that. But the, what we find in Scripture in the life and work of Jesus is God's mission is much broader and more ongoing than that. Otherwise, we Paul didn't need to write the fifth chapter uh, of his letter to the Galatians. The idea that the fruit of the Spirit would produce in us anything would be unnecessary if the mission of God were solely to produce in us the sense that we're going to be okay when we die. But Paul doesn't do that. In fact, Paul rarely talks about that poor that that uh, theme instead he's saying the mission of god takes up res it, it takes its uh, takes you into itself and as god continues down that uh, road of fulfilling his mission you're changed in the process um it's 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 a lot like um the psalm for this week psalm 84 and i remember i used it in my uh online, uh, my, my daily devotional that I, I put out for you um, this past uh, Wednesday, I think it was, uh, maybe Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. And um, in Psalm 84, the, the, the writer is talking about all these things God does. And he uses this line, um, God provides springs and rains, and he takes us from strength to strength. Everything that happens on the mission of God happens in the two. That's, that's, the act, that's where it takes place, taking us from one place to another place. All the agency or activity of God takes place in the two. We make it about some like destiny, but the strength to strength doesn't tell us that fulfilled strength 
He's just moving us always from this strength to the next strength to the next strength. It's this ongoing sweep of the mission of God. And that's what we want to talk about, really for this reason. We just finished, uh, this today will be the second Sunday in Christmas tide. one of the few years that we get two Sundays in the 12 days, within the period of the 12 days of Christmas. And then the Christian season that follows that is the season of Epiphany, or it's where we get, um, oh, I had an Epiphany, or I've had a revelation, I've seen a thing. And normally those eight weeks are spent looking at some of the events in the life of Jesus, teaching, healing, uh, 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 discipling the disciples. And then uh, we take in, uh, after that, the season of Lent, which is a, an, an intentional look at Jesus on his way to the cross. And then, of course, uh, Easter follows that with Easter Eastertide, eight weeks reflecting on the uh, resurrection of Jesus. All, all of that is part of the mission of God. So we're wanting to say, well, this, this discipleship isn't about me making sure I've got the Nicene Creed memorized. It's that these statements uh, produced in the church a particular way of understanding our participation in the mission of God. And so it seemed natural to say, well, we've talked about kind of how, what the church believed. Now let's talk about the ways that that worked out in the life of the church, where the church really isn't God's mission. The, the church, the God's the one who's got a mission. We just are swept up into that mission. The church becomes a, a vehicle. So mission is not a series of activities. It's a way of life. And that's really kind of one, where we want to go from what we call orthodoxy or what right belief to what we call orthopraxy, right practice. What we believe informs what we practice. And to go back to one of our favorites, Paul's mentioned him now a few times, go back to Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard said, it says, you do what you believe. So when we say this is the confession of the church, then we want to, well, so what does that doing that belief look like? And that's where it becomes, you know, practical and important for our as we're going lives. So that's a, hopefully an introduction uh, this morning for you. And um, we'll do a little better job this time since we provided the creed and, and you could look it up and uh, but we'll provide some passages ahead of time, try to post them out, maybe a little sketch, a thought or two, and uh, kind of help kind of maybe prepare you from week to week than just this on, oh, ooh, look at what they, they dropped on me today. And uh, that way you can kind of be a little bit more involved uh, in prep time. So, Paul, anything else to add there? Oh, I would just circle back and and say that, uh, you know, I, I think – we ask who God is, because if there is such a being as a God, uh, then who that God is matters, mm -hmm. um, because it says something about who we are as well. Uh, and and then it kind of comes back to the question, I mean, what is a good life and how do I have it? Um, and that, so so that's really kind of, I think what we're trying to lead to is, it's not just, as you said, to talk about theoretical aspects of uh, the nature of God and, you know, get into the weeds of a bunch of long Latin words or anything like that. It, it ultimately, it's about um, how do I have the kind of life that God intended me to have in this world? Um, mm -hmm because he's left me here. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, and, and so, and, and I don't think he left me here just to continue on a, as the world would impose its ways on me. But I think there are ways that he has said, hey, you can live in this world as uh, broken as it is, as corrupt and sinful as it is, uh, as full of pain and heartache as it is. Uh, you can still live in it in a way that is fulfilling in a way that is meaningful, in a way that is joyful. Um, and so doesn't everybody want to know how to do that? That's right. So so that's why we're asking these questions. That's, right. uh, that's why we're, we're looking at these things. Right, good. Well, again, thank you for being with us uh, at our uh, Sunday online Bible study. We uh, hope you'll continue to, to be safe. Pray for uh, Leroy Griffin. Uh, right now at our recording, he is in... Uh, a hospice house at Integris with uh, COVID virus. We have a number of people who've been exposed. We're waiting to hear back uh, and hopefully that they've not, not gotten this. 
Um, we have heard some good news that some of our folks, because of their working environments, are going to actually receive the vaccine. So that's just gives us people closer to us who who we can have confidence, hopefully, that things are going to move toward an improving situation for us all. So if you're still uh, at a place where you need to join us online, we'll be live streaming worship here in about 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, then. And if you're going to make it here in person, then, well, we'll be here for you as well. So let me pray for us, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll sign off for, for this morning. Lord God, we are glad that those three little words have helped open up new horizons for us. God is love. We're thankful that that worked itself out in you coming to us in Jesus, giving us really a, a vivid uh, picture of what that love looks like. And now that you have worked in our lives, uh, your mercy and grace and love and swept us up into your mission, God, we want to be the sort of people who don't view the things we do as just activities to check off, but as a way of life to be lived. So help us as we pursue this study that that might produce in us uh, uh, the sort of uh, shape that life could take where whatever we are are doing, wherever we are, there will be a a good answer to the question, what is the good life and how can I live it? And we get to point them to Jesus. And we'll thank you for that. Now bless our time of worship. Speak to us and uh, give us ears to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, that's it for this morning. We'll we'll see you either in person, online, and then next Sunday for our online Bible study. Good to see you.